Hello, Fresh Ed listeners. Before the start of this episode, I want to encourage any graduate students listening to consider applying for a Flux Fellowship for our third season. My name is Brett Lashua, and I'm one of the series producers. Flux is a Fresh Ed series where master's and PhD students transform their research interests into narrative-style podcasts. We've just finished our second year of Flux Fellowships, and it's been a huge success. The application window is now open for the third year of Flux, and we're looking for creative, driven, and collaborative graduate students who want to turn their research interests into an audioscape. If that's you, please head over to freshedpodcast.com forward slash flux to find out more about the application details. The deadline for submissions is February 17th, 2023. Okay, now back to Will and on with the show. Hi, Fresh Ed listeners. It's Will here. The Fresh Ed team is taking a few weeks off after a busy year. While we're away, we'll be replaying some of our favorite episodes. Before we start today's episode, I wanted to take a minute to ask for your help. You're listening to us right now for free. In fact, all of our content is open access and freely available. However, it's not free to create, produce, and publish Fresh Ed. We are funded by the generous donations from listeners like you. If you wanted to support independent media, or maybe you've used Fresh Ed in your classes, or you simply love our show, then please consider making a donation. You can do so at freshedpodcast.com slash donate. Again, that's freshedpodcast.com slash donate. Thanks for your support, and we'll be back with new episodes soon. This is Fresh Ed, a weekly podcast that makes complex ideas in educational research easily understood. I'm your host, Will Brem. Today, we explore youth violence in Trinidad with my guest, Hakeem Williams. Because the youth violence that's happening is anchored within a wider web of structural violence. The very fact that we have a dual education system that is codified in law and in practice, um, to me, that's where the structural violence begins. Hakeem situates his study of Trinidad in the country's colonial past. We see the attractor of hierarchization, of marginalization, of exclusion, of border control, all of those things that were part of the colonial era. We see those things absolutely um, at play in a sort of the neo-colonial system of education in contemporary Trinidad. He is also actively creating a new paradigm to address youth violence in schools that blends a systems approach with restorative justice practices. And I believe that our entire system needs to be disrupted, that we can no longer be trying to tweak individual students or trying to tweak one classroom. And of course, that's not to say you don't have individual interventions, but they must not end there. You know, so I argue that restorative restorative justice can be um, scaled up to a systems level. Hakeem Williams is an assistant professor of Africana Studies and Education at Gettysburg College. Earlier this year, he was a visiting scholar at the Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict, and Complexity at the Earth Institute, Columbia University. In today's show, Hakeem discusses his new article, A Neocolonial Warp of Outmoded Hierarchies, Curricula, and Disciplinary Technologies in Trinidad's Educational System which can be found in the latest issue of Critical Studies of Education. Hakeem Williams, welcome to Fresh Ed. Thank you very much for having me. It's really a pleasure to get a chance to talk about my work. So a lot of your work has focused in on Trinidad, and and in a recent article that you've written, um, you speak of the logic of colonialism as having tangible and latent effects on subjects and knowledge and institutions um, of today. So can you give us a quick overview of colonialism in Trinidad? Um, Sure. So I was I was born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago and I left after high school. Um, So I sort of grew up within that entire system. Um, And then I've spent um, all of the rest of my life in, in the United States. Um, for undergrad and graduate school, and I have gone back to study Trinidad, but through different lens, so to speak, because, you know, growing up in a certain context, you are really enmeshed in it, and you have what Barry Oshry calls a kind of systems blindness, 
Um, and so now that I have lived outside the system for so long, I have this sort of insider outsider positionality that allows me to interrogate the system in a different kind of way. Um, and I started looking um, during my dissertation study um, seven years ago, looking at youth violence, so uh, violence in schools among youth. Um, it's, a, it's a problem in Trinidad and throughout the Caribbean, actually. And so I wanted to study something with potentially practical implications. Um, and in studying youth violence, I recognized that the discursive boundaries around youth violence were so narrow um, that they were also, and it makes sense that they would inform um, really narrow foci on particular kinds of interventions, which I found to be problematic um, because the problem is not going away. So it means that the interventions are quite um, ineffective. Um, and in looking at youth violence and sort of widening the discursive parameters around how we describe it, how we discuss it, how we analyze it, how we research it, um, I hit upon, I guess, the sort of structure of violence of the educational system, um, which hasn't grown overnight and, no, and not within a vacuum. And so I've become really interested in this logic of coloniality, which is not my phrase, it's from um, Walter Mignolo. Um, and I'm really fascinated by his work and, and his work has lots of resonance for um, my study in Trinidad. Um, and so Trinidad around 1498, um, uh, Christopher Columbus on his, about his third voyage um, into the Caribbean took a more southerly route and stumbled upon um, what was then called Iere, which is the indigenous word for land of the hummingbird, um, because there were indigenous folks living in the Caribbean anywhere between 3,000 to 6,000 years before um, Christopher Columbus's arrival. And he saw three mountains in the base of Trinidad and called it La Trinidad, um, which is like the Holy Trinity in Spanish. Um, and the Spanish didn't pay much attention to Trinidad because it was such a small island. So they paid more attention to um, what is now Cuba, Puerto Rico, um, you know, islands of the Greater Antilles. And in about the 1790s or so, um, the British took over Trinidad from, from the Spanish um, and they are the ones who sort of ruled over Trinidad um, until Trinidad um, procured its independence in 1962. Um, and it's two islands, Tobago, which is the smaller of the two. So Trinidad and Tobago became a republic in, I think, 1976. So that's a little bit about uh, the history of colonialism in, in Trinidad. So it's like nearly 500 years of colonialism. Uh, absolutely. And... You know, and, you know, Trinidad, you know, is one of um, the Caribbean, really, um, constructed out of sort of a triad of uh, oppressive regimes. So not only colonialism, but slavery and indentureship. And I think it's probably one of the few places in the world that experienced all three of those processes. So let's let's turn to schools and and talk about how the school system in Trinidad and I guess Trinidad and Tobago um formed over, you know, over colonialism and into its independent um, kind of contemporary moment? Sure. So edu education in the Caribbean, as in many places around the world, it, um, tracing its history is, is so complex and complicated. Um, but when, when the colonial apparatus um, was set in place, um, clearly slaves um, and those who were colonized were not recipients of really any kind of formal education um, because they were thought to be thought to be inferior and of course indigenous cosmologies were, were denigrated um, as such and so colonizers were not interested um, in in educating um, their subjects um, because you know because of fears of, of slave revolts and things like that um, but when any kind of education did, did take place eventually, it was primarily religious education and it was through missionaries. Um, and, and then um, as colonialism was winding its way down, um, there were bureaucratic posts that needed to be filled. Um, and so therefore they started training um, uh, former slaves um, 
um, to read, but it was really just to staff those bureaucratic needs. And so those were really token positions. So I would not even call that any sort of mass education the way we understand it today. Um, and so what emerged um, in Trinidad specifically is that um, the, the best performing schools in the contemporary era um, were built in the colonial era um, because they have all of this sort of historical social capital um, and they emerge from, from religious education. But today, they're the ones who get the best performing students on the national exams around the age of 11. All students sit this particular exam and they go to those schools built in the colonial era and we call those schools prestige schools. Um, and um, and then when we procured independence in 1962, there was a, a clamoring for mass education. And so therefore the government set about to do so. But there was, there was already this sort of dual education model um, in place. And a couple years before Trinidad um, sealed into place its independence, um, the schools that were, were run by religious institutions they created this um, this agreement with the government. Um, today it's called the Concordat, and the Concordat essentially um, concretized um, the supervisory role of religious denominations. So the best performing schools today are still re religiously affiliated, um, and they're all government schools, um, and they get lots of funding from the government, um, but however, they have far more say um, in their curriculum, in their pedagogy, in their fundraising apparatus, etc., etc. So now today we have um, an intricate system um, where um, it is it's a dual system, um, part created in the colonial era and a great part created in the post-independence era. So this dual system that you're speaking of, this is about the... the on on one side is this set of religious schools that ha were set up under colonialism and continue today to have this legacy of being prestigious and elite. And then on the other side, are you saying that there's a system of, of mass schooling that is, um, in a sense, lower and not elite and mass? Um, correct. And so the prestige schools are part of the overall national school apparatus. And so when and I had to sit this exam, it, it, then it was called the Common Entrance Exam, now it's called the SEA, um, when, when all children at the age of 11, and, and you could imagine how much pressure <laughs> that is exerted upon these children, I felt very anxious taking this exam because it, it, it kind of determines the rest of your life, um, um, you know, um, and so because the age of 11 you sit in this exam and then you get siphoned off into either prestige school or non-prestige school and if you and I didn't, I didn't initially pass for one of the prestige schools, and so of course you feel, you feel very disappointed. You feel like an uh, sort of intellectual reject, and so and all those things have ramifications for um, students' subsequent performances. Um, not all the time, but you know, many children who I interview, um, they're rather perturbed by how parents and teachers treat them um, when they fail to pass one of these prestige schools. And so, um, so the colonial schools are still part of the national educational apparatus, um, but they have lots of say in the kinds of students they get. Um, and so the politically well-heeled um, parents will send their children to these schools, um, those who have money. Now, granted, all children are sitting the national exam, um, but somehow you don't really find um, children of the elite going to schools that are not prestige schools. It seems like there's a clear class hierarchy in the education system. Oh yes, absolutely. I, I do argue that the dual education system plays a major role in maintaining um, a deeply class stratified society that is, that is contemporary Trinidad and Tobago. So you have this idea that hierarchy is a, a quote-unquote attractor. What, what, what is an attractor and, and, and how are you using it? Sure. So um, I appropriate the term attractor from um, complexity science and dynamical systems theory. Um, and there are some folks, um, AC4, which is based at the Earth Institute at Columbia University, they look at the intersection of conflict and violence and systems thinking. 
um, and and I am interested in that intersection as well, um, though not um, to the intricate um, intricate ends to which they pursue. Um, but an attractor is an organized pattern of systemic behavior. Um, and so it is something that happens over a really long time and it's almost like an ethos. Um, and I guess it's very similar to, I guess I can have a habitus from, from Bourdieu's, to use Bourdieu's term. And so it is, it is an ethos that sets in train over, over time and it influences, it sets the contours for, um, the behavior of a system, um, and the ways in which people behave and respond in that system. And so I, I make a link and a, between the colonial apparatus and, and neo-colonial education in today's system. And I argue that colonialism was in place for such a long time that it created um, this logic of coloniality that is itself an attractor that still shapes the processes and institutions and systemic behavior within Trinidad's educational system and the society writ large that we are not able to escape from. And so that's why I call it a, a neo-colonial warp, um, that the system, the educational system is caught within this system and it's not able to step outside of it. So it's constantly reproducing it as well. Exactly, exactly. And so the logic of coloniality, which is like the major attractor, has other attendant attractors. I guess you can call them sub-attractors or co-attractors. And some of those are um, a logic of hierarchization. Um, and, you, and you see it in the curricula and sort of some of the disciplinary technologies that are used within schools. So I mean, let's we'll, we'll we'll start turning to those now. I mean, so you have been looking at at youth violence for some time in Trinidad Trinidadian schools. Yes. When you were a student, did you experience or see violence inside schools? Um. So I I grew up in a place called Laventil, which um, if you mention it to a Trinidadian and you ask them. What is a quick association they think of it? They will probably say it's known for for violence and it's known for sort of cultural innovation. Um, so violence and drugs and things like that and lots of poverty. So I, I, I grew up um, in a pretty poor community, poor home. Um, and my primary school I went to, um, um, right across from the school, there was this um, what we call plannings. It's, it's akin to, I guess, projects in the United States. And sometimes during our break time, you could hear gunshots um, right across from the schoolyard. And within the school, yes, I myself was bullied, not so much physically, but definitely lots of verbal bullying. Um, but then also, back then, corporal punishment was still permitted in schools. And, um, and teachers used it quite a bit. <laughs> um, and and it, would, it would be for behavioral issues, or it could be for something as simple as as not knowing a particular answer to a question. They would have this long cane and they would sort of beat students with it. Um, and, I mean, those things are absolutely outgrowths from the colonial era. Um, so that's just one example um, of, of certain disciplinary technologies that, that linger on from the colonial era to the contemporary era. W ways of sort of, you know, policing and controlling um, the body and the mind. And would these sort of disciplinary techniques, this school violence, violence or youth violence, would this happen in some of these prestigious religious schools that are, you know, at the top of the hierarchy? Um, so, yes. So when corporal punishment, so by the way, corporal punishment is no longer allowed in schools. Um, but from my research, I've discovered that it, it still happens. Um, it's sort of hush hush, but it, it's still going on. Um, the extent to which I'm not certain because I haven't surveyed all schools, but it's it's certainly part of that, um, I guess, an extension of that biblical injunction um, to not um, not spoil the child by sparing the rod. Um, and so um, kids are still beaten at home and it still happens in schools. Um, but yes, absolutely in the prestige schools, schools built in the colonial era, um, kids uh, were still, still caned, still beaten, um, and it still happens, it still happens today, um, as well. And, um, 
what what is different in terms of the prestige schools and the non prestige schools? The non prestige schools, um, many parents think that their that their children are not getting the same caliber of education. Um, so first of all, the top performing students they get to go to the prestige schools. So the prestige schools are already getting in quotes sort of the creme de la creme of of the student the student body and this is just based on an exam so you know i i, I say creme de la creme in quotes because you know they're differentiated intelligences which are not recognized by the system um again another part of the colonial outgrowth of of setting a hierarchy of intelligences um and so many students who don't pass for the prestige schools they they start off on a kind of footing where they feel as if they are already thrown away. They feel disposable. Um, and they feel as if um, teachers are not that invested in them. Now, that is not completely true because I have been to, I do most of my research at non-prestige schools, and I've seen where um, there are many, many dedicated teachers who are pushing their students to excel and to do very well. Um, but, and I, but I've also done some research in the prestige schools and it's very clear night and day in terms of the differential social capital that the schools have and that the parents bring to the table. Um, and, and we obviously know that there is some kind of linkage, you know, between the social capital and the educational outcomes of students at these various schools. Um, so, so, so they do play a role. So although... Um, children at the prestige schools do experience a certain kind of violence. I would argue that it's far more compounded for children who attend the non-prestige schools. And so, and you talk about this sort of youth violence as structural violence. Why? Um, so first of all, I, I do think that we do need interventions for the youth violence that's occurring in schools. Um... And so because you know, I come from the field of peace education, which is interested in both negative peace and positive peace. And negative peace is really the cessation of direct violence or physical material violence. Um, and positive peace is really interested in the dismantling of structural violence. And so really going beyond just ending physical violence. And so although we have taken out the corporal punishment from schools, um, that, is, that is not enough. Um, and so my research, I'm really hoping that it, it pushes against um, what McLaren calls a discursive violence, right? Because I think the ways in which we talk about violence, that when, they, when policymakers and teachers and parents talk about violence in schools, they're definitely not thinking about structural violence of the educational system. They're really talking about the poor communities where kids come from perhaps some of the, the trauma some kids are experiencing from sexual violence in their homes and all those things. I get those from teachers and students. I know that those things are real issues. But those things are attributing the causes of violence solely to individualistic um, causes. And the influences are far more reaching. And this is why I'm really interested in sort of a systems thinking and a systems intervention around youth violence because the youth violence that's happening is anchored within a wider web of structural violence. The very fact that we have a dual education system that is codified in law and in practice, um, to me, that's where the structural violence begins. The fact that some kids go to schools where um, there is a starkly differentiated set of resources that they have access to. So at at one school that I've been doing my research for the past six years, the principal told me, he said, listen, I need about $5 million to run this school very well. He says, I probably get about 2 to $2.5 million of what I really need to do a very good job for these children. And he says that I never even know when exactly I'm going to get the money, so I can't really plan very well. Um, and then I step across the street and I go to a prestige school, and then they have computers and the parents are far more involved. It, it's, it, is, it is just an entirely different plane we're talking about here. Um, and so when I see those things happening and I see kids who come from single parent homes, coming from poor communities, kids experiencing sexual abuse at home, some kids coming to school very hungry, and there's almost nothing in place 
um, hardly any social workers, hardly any therapists. We have some of those, but it's definitely, it's not enough to deal with, with the need that's there. Um, I think that many of these kids are starting off from day one set up for failure. And because of that entire structure, I, I really call it structure violence because it, it goes beyond just a kid hitting another kid in the classroom. Lots of those issues, we're, we're looking at the, at the symptoms, we're looking at the, the deep, deep issues that the influences that lead, lead to this kid behaving in such a way. And then what happens is that the kid does this and so as to address it, we have this myopic intervention where we will suspend the kid instead of really trying to get some kind of therapeutic intervention, et cetera, et cetera. The kid is then sent home and the kid loses a week of instruction the kid is already not the most academically inclined, so therefore the kid comes back and he has fallen behind in his studies, um, and therefore we recognize over time the kid ends up dropping out, and the dropout rates for non prestige schools it seems to be very, very high. And then lots of these kids, they return to their communities, they end up selling drugs on the street corner, or they end up in a low-paying um, job, and so therefore they reinforce, um, as Paul Willis showed in his fabulous study, um, um, in England um, about 30, 40 years ago. They're really reproducing their class structure. Um, so we really see social reproduction here at play. And I argue that the educational system is doing exactly what it, it's intended. And so we see, we see the attractor of hierarchization, of marginalization, of exclusion, of order and control, all of those things that were part of the colonial era. We see those things absolutely um, at play in a sort of the neo-colonial system of education in contemporary Trinidad. It's interesting that you say that the, the interventions that exist currently to address school violence in a way reproduce the coloniality that, that you've been speaking of. And in a way it is, it's reproducing the structural violence itself. Right, exactly. And, and, and that's why I use the term attractors, because attractors... Um, if you have the, an image of a mountain and a valley, the attractor is down in, in the valley. And the deeper the valley is, um, the steeper it is, it's harder to nudge that attractor out of that, out of that valley and onto, onto a mountain top. And so the attractors are really the valley. So it, it pulls people's behaviors and institutions into the valley. And that's why it's, it's, and the longer that the attractor has been at play, it's a harder for folks to really step outside that system because they're really caught within that steep valley of systemic behavior over a really long time. So what would be an alternative way to address these systemic issues that you've been seeing rather than addressing it from an individual point of view? Sure. Um, so because I'm interested in structural violence and systems thinking, um, I, I argued in this most recent paper for something what I call a systemic restorative praxis, an SRP. And I have stitched together um, literatures and approaches, not just from systems thinking and sort of complexity science, but also from the field of restorative justice and also this notion of praxis from the way Paulo Freire has conceptualized it a sort of a symbiosis of reflection and action. So, so one, I believe that the colonial system and our neo-colonial system, they have rendered much material and psychic um, harm and damage to many of our people. And restorative justice, which um, it's not new, it was really used in indigenous communities in North America and in Australia, essentially where the community would sit in a circle and if someone did something that harmed that community, they would not be sent off or banished to some sort of prison or something like that. They would have to make amends, but they would have to do it in community. So the community believed that you are an integral part of us. You're an important component and we'll hold you accountable, but you will also, will also help you heal and you, you will also help heal the community that you have harmed. Um, so it wasn't about exclusion, it was about inclusion. And we see now restorative justice being increasingly used in schools and in the justice system. So instead of if a kid does um, like steal something from, um, and this is not in Trinidad, this is not in Trinidad as yet, they're trying to implement it. But let's say in the United States, where a kid steals something from a corner store, instead of sending him to juvenile prison, they would use a restorative justice model so the kid can remain within the school and not be excluded and not eventually drop out and, you know, the whole school-to-prison pipeline 
trying to really interrupt that. So it's not it's non punitive. It doesn't actually um, make the student like the example you used earlier about the student who who did something in Trinidad and then was sent home uh, and expelled for a week and then misses a week of lessons and then is more likely to drop out. This is something that you wouldn't necessarily do these punitive measures when. Uh, a child misbehaves in whatever way. Right, exactly. Because right now our system is so heavily focused on 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 punishment. Um, and punishment to me is a neo-colonial attractor because I was part of the colonial era. That our system is so interested in creating sort of docile citizens and children being submissive, not really speaking back, not really challenging the status quo. Um, and... And so I really want to step outside of these punitive frameworks, these ways in which we we even conceptualize human relationality. Um, and so I would like to see restorative justice used more in the schools, but I, I tacked on systemic, um, systemic to the phrasing because restorative justice has been sometimes critiqued because it's often used only for low-level infractions. And I believe that our entire system needs to be disrupted that we can no longer be trying to tweak individual students or trying to tweak one classroom and of course that's not to say you don't have individual interventions but they must not end there you know so i argue that restorative ju restorative justice can be um scaled up to a systems level um, so, for example, Trinidad, Trinidad is a very hierarchical society, which mirrors the colonial era. And so you really don't see parents having a great say in how schools are run. So I think schools should be, should be not as vertical, should be horizontalized. They should become community hubs where parents are welcome, where perhaps someone who is retired can return and, and offer their wisdom and their skills um, so things, things like that. So right now our system is very exclusionary, um, and it's very elitist. Um, and I would like to see restorative justice scaled up, not just from interpersonal interactions, but also on a systems level that we're sort of horizontalizing the ways in which we engage each other. So I'm really calling for a democratization of the educational system that hopefully over time can create counter attractors to colonial attractors and so i would love to see the emergence of certain attractors of inclusion and attractor of participatory participatory ways of um, engaging with the school system things things of that nature where so all the attractors that were existing before i would like to see a sort of a sort of counter hegemonic attractors being set in place it seems like a i mean a rather huge project i mean the momentum of 500 plus years of colonialism it seems like you know it this is a daunting task to 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 set up a systemic change that that creates counter attractors to the ones that you've you've articulated are so embedded in the system of just we've just been talking about schooling but i'm sure in in other systems of society also have these similar attractors yes absolutely you know and you know i I also anchor Trinidad within its region and within the international um, forum of global governance, educational structures, um, certain educational regimes, um, because the logic of coloniality is not specific to Trinidad. That you know, it's 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 absolutely a part of a global apparatus. And so the things that we're seeing in Trinidad today, I see echoes of it in many other parts of the world. And yes, indeed, it does seem daunting. And I'm, you know, I'm not under any illusions that this is something that will be, you know, fixed, you know, in a year, five years, 10 years, you know, I'm committing the rest of my life to building capacities um, in communities, in schools, with teachers, engaging policymakers. So because I'm taking this eventually taking a systems approach, um, I think that the interventions need to be on not only the micro, which is where we've been doing, but on the meso levels in terms of working communities, working with the Ministry of Education, but also on the macro level. Um, just this year, um, I was in Trinidad for my sabbatical leave, and they had a national hearing, Parliament had a national hearing on school violence, and I guess they encountered my work, and I, I was called before 
um, parliament to present on my work and I submit a report to them. But that's that's just one intervention. I believe that all of those things have to have to happen simultaneously um, to make a dent in the system over time. So I'm, I'm really optimistic. I'm really hopeful. Um, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm reverting to building capacities and communities. So I do. I spent seven months offering free restorative justice um, trainings and running actual restorative circles in communities with parents, running them with students, teaching kids peer mediation skills, conflict resolution skills. I worked with children's homes, um, with their staff members on how to engage youth differently. And, and I believe that over time in building capacities that people will begin to see each other in different ways in using, using these skills that will engage each other, engage the system in different ways. So over time, my hope is that, um, differentiated attractors will will develop um, and hopefully provide a counterweight to the prevailing attractors. Uh, it just sounds like such an amazing project. I mean, I wish you the best of luck with it. Um, and hopefully in, you know, the, the coming years and we can have you back on to uh, to get an update about how, how it's going. Hakeem Williams, thank you so much for joining Fresh Ed. Um, it was really a pleasure to talk. Thank you so much for having me on. A pleasure. I look forward to speaking with you again. Hakeem Williams is Assistant Professor of Africana Studies and Education at Gettysburg College. You can find his latest paper on Trinidad in the current issue of Critical Studies in Education. Fresh Ed is brought to you by the Globalization and Education Special Interest Group of the Comparative and International Education Society. Original music for Fresh Ed was created by Digital Primate. Please note that opinions expressed on Fresh Ed are solely those of the host or the guest interviewed, not CIES or the Globalization and Education SIG, which take no institutional positions. If you've liked what you've heard, please rate us on iTunes. It helps. And please be sure to visit us at freshedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Will Brem, and I'll see you next week.